Gator Nation, welcome in to another episode of the In All Kinds Weather Forecast. I am your host, Chris Yanes, alongside with my co-host and potential Pulitzer Prize winner, Neil Shulman. Uh, we're going to be recapping today part one and part two of his newly released articles on inallkindsofweather.com, chronicling the Dan Mullen era and the downfall of it and what has led now into the rebirth of Florida football under Billy Napier. Uh, this was a really engaging piece to read. Neil had shared this with me a couple of days before he actually released it to the public. And I got to say, uh, it's very clear the amount of time, effort, uh, and hard work that he put into this research and and also was pretty amazed with the amount of guests he was able to uh, collaborate with both former and current football players on the team. And it really does shine a light on what has transpired in the program over the last couple of years and gives us a hope and where we're headed uh, for the next couple to come under the Billy Napier regime. So Neil, go ahead and bring you in here. Let's talk about part one. We'll get into part two. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is a two segmented thing, whereas, you know, we have that four segmented uh, Netflix documentary that's now dropped this week on the Gators football program. So lots of, you know, stuff recapping certain parts of the Gator football program right now out there for fans to read as we are now only eight days away. By the time this is released, probably a week out now from Utah kicking it off. So, Neil, you know. Just go ahead and give the fans an idea of why you did this, because I think there is, you know, a fan base out, a section of the fan base out there that probably doesn't really want to relive the Dan Mullen era anymore. They don't want to talk about it anymore. It's in the past. It's over. It's done. Why did you decide to do the research and what led the down to the downfall of the Dan Mullen era? Well, I mean, the, the response to, to people who who think that, you know, we don't have any reason to want to relive the Dan Mullen era is that those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat it. And I mean, the whole point of this of this two piece investigation is that Billy Napier is not Dan Mullen. But regardless, there has to be some kind of understanding of what went down in order for us to learn from our mistakes because we can apply a lot of the lessons that Dan Mullen refused to learn as the head coach of the Florida Gators to our own lives. I mean, some of us reading that are business owners. Some of us have, I mean, side businesses. I mean, this is not even my main source of income, but it is a, a side business of mine. And I see myself as a somewhat of a bit of a business owner. And there are things that Mullen did and the ways he operated that I look at and I go, you know what? It, it might be, it might be fun to do that one day, but if that situation ever comes if in all kinds of weather ever grows to that size that we have, you know, all those tiers, all those levels of, uh, of people, I'm going to have to make business decisions. Like that's just me. Everyone else who reads this is going to have some different way that they can relate to it. And I think it's important that we all just understand simply as Gator fans, if nothing else, why it all collapsed, because you can look at his first couple of years and go, well, peach bowl win top 10 finish orange bowl win top 10 finish. How can you let him go? Oh, the next year he beats Georgia and goes to the SEC title game and almost wins it. How can you fire him? Yeah. But, but he was winning in spite of the way he operated, not because of the way he operated, which was not sustainable. And that was the, the theme of the first piece that it, it had run its course and a change had to be made. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, we all have said that we were open, big time supporters of Dan Mullen through almost at all. I mean, really, I think the fan base truly turned on him in 2021 when the season just went to absolute hell and he clearly did not care about recruiting. Something had to change. Either he had to complete a 180 in that moment or we had to move on and it was very clear that the former was not going to happen. So, you know, I think it wasn't, it's safe to say this was not in any way meant to be a hit piece, but it really was more of a chronicle of where the program was at the time and what was going on behind the scenes that led to some of the decisions as you, you know, you, you detailed out there, it was usage of the staff who was being retained based on job performance. The fact that Dan Mullen actually made sure that he had his contract extension and didn't even think about his other assistants, the players themselves and the way they were treated by the assistant coaches. You know, it, there was a lot of things that went into it that led to the collapse and the culture when everything at the surface 
when you were winning 10 plus games a year and going to near six bowls seemed like it was, it was going just fine. Yeah. Uh, first thing I have to respond to is, is the hit piece uh, thing, because I, I've gotten that quite a bit from people who still don't understand why Dan Mullen was fired. And the answer to that is nobody told Dan Mullen to operate the way that he did. Nobody forced Dan Mullen to give me the ammunition to write that quote unquote hit piece. If you, if you go on at allkindsweather.com and you go to that magnifying glass and you go to the search function and you type in the short list choices to replace Jim McElwain, you will find an article in which Dan Mullen is the number one choice on it. I wanted Dan Mullen to replace Jim McElwain. And I thought through two years that he was doing a great job. I mean, he was the OC for those Swamp Kings years. You mentioned that documentary. I thought he could recreate that magic. We saw what he did at Mississippi State with Dak Prescott. I wanted him to be the guy so badly. So to those calling you a hit piece, to those calling this a hit piece, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but you know what? If if Dan Mullen had maybe fired Todd Grantham and John Hevesy as not only myself, but everyone in the fan base outside of this small percentage of people who still think it's a hit piece, the way everyone else knew that he had to do, maybe if he played Kyle Trask over Felipe Franks, maybe if he played Anthony Richardson over Emory Jones before it got to that Georgia game, you know, maybe if Andrew Chatfield and James Houston saw the field more, maybe if Damian Pierce saw the field more, maybe this wouldn't be happening and there wouldn't be the opportunity for a hit piece, if 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 you want to even call it that. So again, like I really wish it didn't have to come to this. I'm just here looking at what these people who used to play for him are telling me and just adding up two plus two and not doing these mental gymnastics to make it equal five, but it's just it is what it is. And that's the sad part, but it is what it is. Yeah. And I think you kind of touched on what my biggest takeaway of the article was, at least this part was that there were things completely within his control. And I know recently he's made some comments about how the administration wasn't fully bought in or, and how I know that is that he's said, Oh, it's good to see the administration's buying into what Billy Napier wants to do. And then and there's validity to that. The, the, the administration drug their feet on facility upgrades. They drug their feet on giving the staff more money for recruiting, for support staff, things like of, of that nature. But the, the administration didn't, control who you played a quarterback. It didn't control who you hired as your defensive coordinator, who were your staff members, how you recruited, when you recruited, the vigor with which you recruited. There were things within his control where the administration eventually could have come around if he was still doing the right things. The product on the field still would have been sufficient for him to keep his job. And, you know, maybe we he would have gotten finally the support that Billy Napier is seeing now but with the veracity that it is. So I, I think that that was my biggest takeaway of part one is that there are things you can control in life. And in any situation, there are things you can control, but the things you can control, you better focus on. Otherwise you're going to have no situation to control whatsoever. Yep. That's, that's it. And that's what I was alluding to in the first, in, in my first um, response was that there are lessons for each of us to take away from this that we can apply in our own life. Now, none of us probably are ever going to be the head coach of the Florida Gators. But again, there are some parallels to being in positions of power, being in positions of, as you say, control, being in leadership positions where we're going to have to learn from others' mistakes. Because if you don't learn from others, you're going to make the same mistake yourself. That's the, what the that's what the phrase, those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat it means. That's what it's all about. And I really, really didn't want it to come to this. But again, the bottom line is that if you're going to be the head, the CEO, the leader, the president, whatever you want to call it, you have to make business decisions. And that's something that, you know, part two gets into. You're going to see it in Swamp Kings if you haven't already. Um, you're going to see it this year with Billy Napier. You saw it last year with some of his personnel decisions. And it's just going to be something that you're going to see successful companies, enterprises, brands, businesses. You're going to see successful operations all implement. At the end of the day, it's like President Harry Truman said, the buck stops with me. Well, Neil, before we move on to phase two, 
and the I think the more positive, hopeful portion of this investigation. I just want to ask, what were your biggest takeaways? Maybe some of the tougher parts of the investigation. Obviously, you talked to a lot of former players who were there during this time period, and, and I'm sure had many great memories at the University of Florida, are very thankful to be Gators. Many of them are still associated with the program to some degree. But what was that like interviewing some of the players and hearing some of those stories that you know were less than pleasant? The smear campaigns were by far the worst part of of the investigation. Learning about that was horrifying. Um, and there, there's a piece in that in part one where I, I go on to have a, a former player quote that it's you know I, I'm in agreement that they screw James Houston over, but what people need to know is that it wasn't just him. It was everyone who transferred out. And that was the part that I wasn't initially aware of. I knew what happened to Houston because everyone I'm sure who follows us on social media knows he's one of my closest friends. So yeah, I knew about that when it was happening, but I thought that they were just being particularly truculent towards him. I didn't realize it was happening left and right to every single player who would leave it. And that's just disgusting because I mean, first of all, it, it's not your it's not your decision at, or, or, sorry, it is your decision as a head coach to play them or not play them. Now, if a player wants to leave because of a sick family member, like someone like Keontae Goodwin, that's we're not talking about that. But if you decide to not play somebody and they want to transfer for more playing time, that's your fault. So there's like there's a there's a moral obligation for you to not let not let his his reputation be ruined by that. Like that, that to me was just horrifying that first you don't play these guys and then you go and pick up the phone when someone calls and goes, yeah, he's just a locker room cancer, man. He, that's why he doesn't play with us. Or he's, he picks fights with his teammates or there was one, there was one completely bogus statement. That's not even in the article, but I'll say it now. Cause no one's going to know which player it was about. Yeah. The, the player just smashed a glass bottle in the locker room. Cause he was so upset. That, that never happened. There, there was no player that did that, and that's why he was transferred. And that's what that's what the Florida staff said. That that never happened. They're they're just making up absolute falsehoods about these players for no reason other than they want to avoid blame when it comes back around to time to to question them as to well, what what in the hell were you doing not playing this kid? He's going to West Virginia. He's going to Wisconsin. He's going to USC, and he's a star there. How is he not seeing the field at Florida? He was this good. They they would do anything to avoid that, including ruining the reputations of good kids who did nothing wrong other than want to do what they've wanted to do since they were four years old, and that's play football. So, I mean, learning about it happening to TJ McCoy, learning about it happening to scores of unnamed other players, Andrew Chatfield, I did mention in the article, so can mention that again here. It's happening to Andrew Chatfield, he's way too good for, quote-unquote, Oregon State to be the best he can do as someone in those offices in the Mullen era, not now. Someone in those Mullen offices. That, are, are you serious? Like, no, it's getting, as you can hear, it's getting me irritated all over again because there's no point in doing this. You have no reason to do this. You could have avoided all this by playing them yourself. And now you're making yourself look terrible because this is all coming out, which was part of the motivation for me to do this. Yeah, and it's a shame. You know, they're 18 to 22 year old young men. And for grown men to do that is unacceptable, especially, you know, all of them were in that similar situation at one point in their lives. And, and even if they did do some, things that were less than savory or, you know, as long as you know, they weren't breaking the law, they weren't doing anything that was really detrimental to themselves or other people. You know, they were just being 18 to 22 year old guys in some situations. I get that. But, you know, the, to, to make up overt lies is, is certainly bad. And, and it was definitely something that was uh, disheartening to see, but unfortunately not surprising given what we know now about the regime of that time period, the tenure and where it ended up happening. I want to make it clear that I, that it was not for those of you who didn't read it or maybe listening to this before you read it. It was not Dan Mullen that that did it. I'm I'm 99 percent sure. Uh, I have it on good authority that it was someone well below him. So just you know, for those who are just preferring to listen to this or, or watch this to you know skimming, I think it's 14,000 words of English who just want to get the gist of it here. It, it wasn't Mullen himself who did it, but it was someone underneath him that absolutely ran those smear campaigns um, on 
on, on Houston, on Andrew Chatfield, on TJ McCoy, on tons of other players who wound up leaving the program. And it was someone else underneath him who just made up this story about the player smashing a glass bottle. So don't blame Mullen for actually, you know, making that stuff up. But if, you know, if you want to blame him for something, blame him for failing to stop it. That's probably the most accurate way to put that. Yeah. Well, moving on to the next regime, though, the next phase of this article, you know, it's it's night and day, right? It's night and day. We've already seen it. We've been talking about it over the last year since Billy Napier arrived in December of 2021. See, God, it feels like it's been, it's been crazy to say that now. It's almost been two years since he arrived here in Gainesville. But night and day. In the, it's awesome to hear and read the stories of recent recruits, transfers that he's brought in. And I think what we've always known about Billy Napier, but what really once again stood out in this part two was just how genuine of a human being he is. He's a genuine person who's relationship driven, and that has been the person he has been his entire life. And experiences and moments and people are what impact and influence him as an individual. And it's very evident to see that in the players that he brings in and the relationships he begins to build with them and their families. And it, this, nothing was really surprising here, Neil, but what were some of your big takeaways from what you learned from the newer players, the new regime, and ultimately where the university of Florida set in? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing I should probably point out to everyone about, especially about this piece, and really the whole thing, uh, both parts one and two, was this was never something that was like premeditated. I was, I, know, I was part of Gator Collective. I was one of the outreach members for that for that old um, NIL entity, the Florida Gators, and I just went to a fan day event just to meet some of the players that had you know been following me on Twitter for some time. Wanted to just say, hey, I'm Neil. I'm the guy that runs in all kinds of weather. Nice to meet you. Just chatting with them. And so during those conversations, which were very very casual at first, I would just say, yeah. So what's it like playing for Coach Napier? And the more I talked to them, the more I realized. Yeah, there, there's a real story here because as I talked about, you know, moments ago, my friendship with James Houston is something that, you know, everyone knows. Fun fact, by the way, he was not involved in this piece. I know everyone's going to think so because of that. Oh, he was one of the anonymous quotes. No, he, he really wasn't. Um, as I wrote in the piece, he just wants to move on with his life. He just started on the NFL. I did ask him one time. He did not want anything to do with it. I said, okay, decision respected, move on, reached out to other guys. All my quotes and info came from other players, but anyway, so through Houston, I'd gotten a really deep understanding of how things operated under Mullen. And I do want to make one thing clear that it wasn't always bad. It wasn't all bad. Mullen could be funny. He was an offensive genius. Some players did like him. There was genuine trust in him from players for you know two plus years. So through what Houston said and through the players he's introduced me to, his friends on those teams, I've kind of learned to detect when there's a little something deeper to a response than just the surface. Like, Example, a player says, oh, yeah, I love Dan Mullen. He's great. He's genuine. Most players, from my experience, unless they're either really media savvy or they're well-trained or they're just great actors, which is, I mean, to be blunt, not a lot of them. That I mean, football players are not like typically the best you know, performers. So most of these players have tells. Like in poker, you can kind of tell when someone's lying or telling, you know, a perfectly reasonable white lie to protect themselves so that this explosive quote doesn't come back and bite them uh, or leave out contacts that they know presents a more true and accurate picture. There are usually little subtle keys in their voice inflections. Uh, I don't want to give them all away. I don't want to get them in trouble, but a lot of them will have these little tells that will that will that will give you a clue. Like there's something more to what they're saying. Like they're saying this to try to make you feel good without making themselves look like a jerk because they just threw their coach under the bus. The point of saying this is when I would talk to all the players in that Mullen era about how awesome things were in like 2018, 2019, they weren't lying because Florida was winning. So they couldn't be too negative, but there were these little tells just a little bit of hesitance conveyed here and there. And when I casually chatted these players up, not a single one that I spoke to did anything of the sort when I asked about Coach Napier. And that's where this story was really born because every single player had this genuine 
just a almost explosive smile come over their faces. Like they're so happy. They're so genuinely joyful to talk about coach Billy Napier. And that's a big difference. I did not notice that with Dan Mullen. I did not notice that with players in the Jim McElwain era. One of my first, one of my first Gator friends um, since, you know, founding in all kinds of weather was, I think, yeah, it, it was, it was Cam Dillard. He was either one of the first or the first, he was the first um, like Gator player to follow me back and like start, talking to me and just like from him on there were always just these little things here and there that just made me especially now in retrospect think yeah it sounds great but like they're hesitating their voices are going up they're like thinking a little harder than maybe they should about this question no not with napier it's the first time i've ever noticed that with players they are so genuinely elated to play for billy napier yeah, and, and that has been a common theme when you listen to them and also when they interact with media. Like they all they all buy into what he's selling. They all buy into the things he says, he's instilling that discipline aspect. It, it's starting to resonate all the way through the program. And now it's easier to do now that you have a roster of basically 70% that is his at this point. And whatever's left over from the Mullen era, those are guys that bought into the vision. These are guys that wanted the change were welcoming it and are excited to see what they have here and have, have completely bought into it. But what do you think moving forward in just talking with the players? How soon do you think this can transform the program? Cause I think that's what really what fans want to see is, okay, we're turning the page from the Mullen era. We're in the Napier era going into year two. This is a, a year where we still believe we're going to be in some transition, but year three, year four, that's where we want to hopefully see that culture really just flip its head. It's a roster that's full of Napier players and it's a complete 180 from where we were just two short years ago. Right. So, I mean, my, my personal favorite talking point is if you look back at 2022 with the exception of Ventral Miller, probably Justin Shorter. And I guess you could say Ethan White, the best players on that field were true freshmen and transfers. And if that trend continues, we're going to see a step forward in 2023 because we have to, because there simply is a greater quantity of Billy Napier players than there were in 2022. Now, obviously we don't have a top five pick at quarterback this year. I think that's going to have a lot to do with it. Uh, it's unfortunate that that one position you know, has so much of the game hinge on it, but I think you're going to see a Florida team that's going to be a lot better fundamentally. I mean, we saw a lot of guys out there last year not understanding what they were doing, especially on defense, because you know, in the, in fairness, it was a, a very, very, it was it was it was a seismic shift in their defensive scheme. It wasn't even like a, I can't even say a very big change. It was an absolutely enormous change from what Todd Grantham had them doing to what Patrick Tony wanted to do. And now, yeah, he's gone and Austin Armstrong is here, but there's a lot of similarities between those two schemes. So there's going to be a lot more familiarity with the Florida players on defense this year. And I think that has a lot to do with how we're going to see them play. And as for you know, some of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes with, with Mullen, you, you just don't have that anymore. You don't have situations like what I, what I explained in the, in the Georgia game where you have guys, especially on the offensive line who are trying their hardest, but for themselves and they're not communicating and they're not talking about, you know, what stunts might be coming from this all American defense that Georgia's got out there. They're just fire out of their stance power, strong, let's get a pancake block. Oh, that'll go on my NFL highlight road. There's just not any of that this year. There wasn't really much of it last year. What little of it there was, I can say with 99% confidence is gone now. So you're, you're, you're going to see steps forward simply because of that. And now compare now combine that with the fact that there is simply a larger number of Billy Napier guys on the field I think it's going to be hard not to see at least at, at least some progress. I mean, no one's going to expect us to go 12 and 0 or 11 and 1, but there's going to be some steps in the right direction this year. As for 24, you know, just keep moving forward one step at a time and then we can cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah, and I think you're really touching on the discipline aspect. The discipline aspect of the team where 
these guys finally are they just buy into what what they're saying and it's going to show up on the field because there were times last year where they were not disciplined it showed up on the field they made critical errors and mistakes at key points in the game whether that was penalties turnovers miscommunication especially on the defensive back end where we were giving up multiple third downs uh over and over and over again so I think that those are the things where because these guys now are all working together in, co- in, in cohort, you'll see less of those mistakes on the field. And just watch. I've watched the first two episodes of the documentary of Swamp Kings, and it is so crazy to see the change in culture from year one to year two. That change in the, the guys didn't buy in to what. Urban Meyer was selling right away. And Urban Meyer was a ruthless, pragmat- pragmatic person in getting guys to buy in. I don't believe that's Billy Napier whatsoever. I think Billy Napier has a different way of going about dealing with situations like that. And I think if the transfer portal had existed back in 2005, we would have seen a lot more guys probably transfer out of the Florida program at that time. But you saw the second year where you got that first big recruiting class come in. I'll be at the number one in the country, but those guys all bought into the vision, the future. It was channeled in the summer workouts, channeled in spring practice, carried into fall. And then when it was time for games in those big critical moments, like that Tennessee game, like that LSU game, like that South Carolina game, the SEC championship, and then the national championship, the guys were remembered the lessons they learned and it showed up in critical moments when everything was on the line. Now, this is not me saying we are going to have that kind of a jump in year two under Napier. I do not believe that. Neil does not believe that. I don't think there's a person out there that is honest with themselves believes that. But that could at least equate to much better than six and six, much better than what the media prognosticators are saying about this team and what they're predicting. What Vegas has us as an over under five and a half win total. I think you now start to see all of the work that's been put in from year one to year two, and now all of everything they've put in in the off season until you up to now, we're going to see it a week from now. And I think we're going to be battle tested multiple times because we play the number two schedule in the entire country. We'll play five potential top 15 teams this season. We're going to have opportunities to put that to the test. So we're going to see. Yeah. we And that's uh not just not to spoil our next episode, but I mean, we talk about that in pretty good detail with our next guest, um, Allie Peak, also known as Allie Wilbur, the wife of a former Florida punter, the sister of a former Florida wide receiver. She's got connections. She knows what she's talking about. That's a great episode. We actually recorded just before this one that's going to be dropped on Friday morning. But long story short is Florida is going to be tested. And you know what? That's how they want it. They want it that way. If I mean, to ask Shamar James, one of the quotes that actually didn't make it into the article was, and this is you know, the, this is the point of a, of a BTS uh, show to talk about this, but one of the quotes that didn't make it in the article was, if I could have it my way, then I would want Georgia and Alabama every week because that's how you know you're going up against the best. And I mean, I'm, I'm assuming he meant something like, well, you know, if LSU is the best team, Give me them. Like if 2019 LSU is available, toss them my way. Let's go. Let's suit them up. You got 2013 FSU out there. Let's see them. Let's go. 2014 Ohio State, bring it on, et cetera. That's just the mindset that these guys have. And that's one of the themes that Billy Napier really seeks when he's on the recruiting trail. He wants alphas. He wants guys that are just going to be wired that way. And that's why I really do believe in him because Every single guy I talk to, whether three star, five star, they're from Florida, they're from Texas, they're from whatever, they all have this this killer mentality that you mentioned Swamp Kings. A lot of guys in that documentary that you heard had that killer mentality. Ahmad Black, Brandon Seiler, Brandon Spikes, Tim Tebow, you know, and Rainey, every single one of them, James, they all had that killer mentality. And while Napier might not be the same kind of person as Urban Meyer, he's a lot, for lack of a better word, uh, nicer. Cerebral. Then, he's cerebral. Much yes, more cerebral. Yeah. Cerebral, cerebral is a good word. I would also say he's a little bit more genuine than Urban Meyer. I think Urban definitely had some uh had some had some salesman-y 
tactics he would use, uh, if not downright snake tactics, but obviously it worked out. Napier seems to be the same sort of level in terms of recruiter, in terms of how, how he attacks the art of recruiting, but he seems to be a much more genuine person that, that players can go to. And we talked about Ali peak with this too. There's just a different type of player now. Like it's a different generation players, you know, they're raised differently. There's just things are considered different levels of acceptable now than they were back then. So things that urban Meyer tried in 2005 to 2010 wouldn't fly now in 2023. Napier is the perfect coach for this time. I don't know that it necessarily would have even worked back in 2005, 2010. I'm not sure that that kind of player would have responded to it the same way that I am positive that Urban Meyer would not work in today's day and age. And we know that because he tried with Jacksonville and that didn't work. So we understand that different times can can breed different um, necessities and necessary personalities. It seems to me that Napier is tailor-made for the Florida job in 2022 and moving forward. With NIL, the the temperament needed to coach the Gators now, all that, he just seems like he is the guy. Well, leadership is situational, and there's always the right leader at the right time at the right place. And Urban Meyer was the right guy at the right time at Florida. Steve Spurrier was the right guy at the right time in 1990 when he arrived back at the University of Florida. And Billy Napier hopefully will be that guy when he arrived in 2022. So we'll, we'll, it all remains to be seen, but you know, it's exciting. Great work, Neil. Uh, thanks for for coming on and, and recapping that with us. And if you have not already, please go to in all kinds of read the first part, read the second part, drop a comment review here in this video. Tell us what you think of it and give us some feedback here on the show. As you've seen, Neil and I have been starting to drop a lot more videos here on YouTube. We are here to grow out the In All Kinds Weather Forecast YouTube channel. So please follow, hit that like button down below. It really helps us with those algorithms here on YouTube to reach our audience, reach all of Gator Nation and bring you even more great content. So please subscribe, like, leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing and Make sure to also go on our website and get some merch. Neil, uh, do you want to show the fans the merch? Yeah, I mean, if you haven't been able to see it yet, this is uh, one of the many new pieces of merch we've got. This is shout out to Printify. It was uh, it was custom made. This is every piece of merch on Printify. It's it's comfortable. I mean, I, I'm doing this. I'm doing this this show in a, in a workout shirt, but it just it's so comfortable. I can't help it. And obviously, I did want to show it off because it's new and it's the first piece of merch that came by. But as you can see, the quality of the logo is is immaculate. It's it's just perfect. And you know, thank you, Printify. Thank you um, to. I mean, everyone who's bought merch so far, if you haven't gotten yours yet, there is still time to get yours before the first home game against McNeese. So go to in all kinds of weather.com slash merch, get yours today. And yeah, I mean, thank you everyone for reading the piece. It was again, I know to, to close this out, it was not necessarily the most joyful thing to do, especially the first part. The second part was, was very enjoyable to, to construct, but, you know, learning about some of the things that, I, th- I think a lot of Gator fans did kind of know, but they didn't know if that makes sense. Like you knew, but you didn't know, like you knew that something bad was happening. You didn't know how bad it was. And for me, you know, having, having known some of the stuff that wasn't public before. And then even I didn't know the extent of it was just was, was flooring to, to learn about some of those, those awful things that happened during what I thought were cool times. Cause you know, Hey, my, one of my best friends plays for the Florida Gators. Isn't that cool? And then to learn that it's just, you know, yeah, he is, but like, there's just so much awful stuff happening in the background. So that part sucked, but it had to be told. I hope that we all can learn something from it. I don't wish Dan Mullen ill. I don't know that I'll say the same for Grantham, but you know, I, I hope Mullen can, you know, make something of himself after his, you know, his, his post Florida days. But you know what? It is what it is, and we've got the right guy in charge now. I I hope that against, you know, I hope that he is going to be the one to lead us to the glory. I hope he is going to win us national championships. But whether he does or not, we needed to make a change, and Napier has the foundation in place to be the one to take us to the top. Whether he will or not, we'll see but he's got the foundation laid down correctly.
Absolutely. Well, we'll be eagerly waiting. We are a week out from the season starting. Thank you again for tuning in to the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. And please tune in for more great content over the next week as we get ready for the 2023 season. Go Gators and have a great day.